Uh, I'm joined by, um, this is, this is exactly the kind of distraction we're talking about, we didn't arrange that honestly. Um, I'm joined by Felix today who, who leads the innovation team with me at Hey Human and um, we're delighted to be speaking to you on um, the battle for attention live, so thanks for bearing with us, we're actually trying to do a live look inside someone's brain today, so as you can imagine, versus the usual plugging in, it's quite, it's quite complex. Um, but we're, we're delighted to be supported as well by uh, Dr. Thomas Ramsoy from Neurons Inc. and also Advanced Brain Monitoring, who Rob has just brilliantly fiddled with the various, various leads to get us going. So, um, so why this topic? At Hey Human, we, we obsess about people's behaviours. And as part of that, we have ongoing research about the relationship with brands and the relationship with people and what is actually really going on versus what people think or what they say. And often that's quite at odds with what you typically get out of, say, a traditional quality research group. And so, as part of this, we looked at various different brands, and within that, we looked at technology brands. And what we found was quite extraordinary. So when people start talking about their relationship with technology, it, it becomes quite obsessive and it's kind of, you know, this is my, I love my smartphone, I can't be without it. And they really feel that it helps them multitask um, and brilliantly command their lives. And it absolutely allows them to maximize their efficiency. And so that, that was really interesting to us. And so, you know, the, the final expression was, I literally can't live without this device. If my, if my phone fails, I don't know people's numbers, I don't know where my next meeting is, and so on. And that was, that was really what we wanted to explore further and what we hope to share with you today. So, we actually ran a neuroscience study, um, which you see from the flavor of, but it added spice today as we're actually doing it live, so you can see what's going on in people's brains in real time, to look at what's going on in people's heads when they're multi-screening. So although we feel this is quite a natural activity and we do it regularly at work and at home, um, it's actually really interesting what that does for attention, and that's what we'll talk to you about. So I think just to give you an idea of what we're, what we're going to go through, um, we've naturally got the, the live experiment to show you in real time the impact that adding a device has on our focused attention. Um, and we'll, we'll hand over to the, to the guys from, from uh, Neurozine to do that. We're going to illustrate the very human and finite limits of our headspace. Because I think there's, you know, there's some interesting thinking around human beings at the moment where we seem to almost be treating ourselves like machines. And I think that you know, the, the blatant fact is we aren't. And that's, that's what we'll come on to show is the impact on attention and mental energy. And I think importantly, in the, in the context of speaking to someone that's overloaded, it kind of reframes communications because if you actually we approach it in that way, then not all our work can be engaging in forward storytelling. Some of it has to be really simple. And I think that's what we'll get to at the end in terms of sharing the new rules for creativity in this context and how, how we can move forward from that. So I think just before we lean into the brain, uh, if, we, if we think about the digital revolution versus human evolution, there's two quite distinct lines going on here in terms of progress. And so just first, if we think about kind of the advance of consumer technology, and even the guy that came up with Moore's Law is really surprised that um, computer chips that continue to double their processing power every two years for the last 50 years. And we're still accelerating that pace of change. So from a tech point of view, the capacity has absolutely exploded and continues to. And a lot of people think this can actually accelerate as new substrates come to the floor, like graphene, for example. So, you know, from a computer point of view, it all looks pretty rosy in the garden. Um, I think when you compare that with the human brain in terms of our progress, and I don't know what this line would look like over the last four days in can, it might even be increasing. But um, it's actually we're, we're flatlining. So you know, from a software and hardware point of view, the wetware that's in our noggins is not actually keeping pace at all. And you know, more than this, if you speak to paleontologists, they actually say that in the last 10,000 years, our brains have actually decreased in size. So this is, is related to lots of different things like physical size, the amount of physical labor that we have to do. And actually, the good news is, even though we've lost you know, a, a lump of grey matter the size of a tennis ball from our heads, it doesn't mean that we're, we're 
developing in idiocracy. We're actually, we're not getting dumber necessarily. Actually, a smaller brain is more energy efficient, and it's thought to be more streamlined for signaling within the brain, because the actual distances involved are slightly shorter. So that's one of the good news. I think the, the wider context, though, of digital lives and the disparity that we're illustrating here is that although it's an opportunity for brands, it's also a massive challenge because when you do get to talk to people, it's probably harder to reach them en masse. And when you do, they're much more likely to be distracted. So, you know, it's really thinking about how we deliver into that with different creative strategies to do so. So, uh, you know, this is mentioned a lot, but I think if we, if we do think about the economy of attention, and this is, this is based on some brilliant work that um, Harvard, Harvard Business School did, and they actually looked at a notional dollar value for attention. And they, they found that in terms of the, the limited supply that we have, but the increasing demands of digital, if you put a dollar value around that, then notionally, um, the cost of attention has increased 20% in the last four years. And I think that's only going to increase. And if we think about that, you know, why should people invest their attention with us? That really is a key question that we need to think about in our comms today. So I think we, you know, it's true to say we have an abundance of, of messaging, but a poverty of attention. And so that's really what we want to try and look at today and think about strategies how we can address that. And I suppose the danger, you probably all recognise this from Toy Story, but the danger here is that we turn into pancake people. So this was actually um, based on a, a quote by a playwright called Richard Fullman, who describes us as spread wide and thin as we connect with that vast network of information at the touch of a button. And that's probably something we all feel in our lives. And I think there are, there are symptoms of just how um, ingrained this stuff is with us in terms of, I don't know if you've ever had this, but you sometimes feel that your phone's ringing and you take it out and it's not, it's not ringing at all. So you get this sort of, it's actually so prevalent there's a scientific term for it called phantom vibration syndrome. So you, this is thought to be symptomatic of the brain being so disposed to distraction but it's actually starting to create its own stimuli around distraction because it wants to interact. You know, it's a very reward-heavy, dopamine-rich activity every time we tweet, send an email, etc. And so this is really what's going on. So I think, you know, what we might think of as mere multitasking is actually something much more significant at a phys physiological level. And so um, I'll hand over to Felix just to talk you through the distinction that we hope to illustrate today. Cheers, Sam. Yeah, so we wanted to get into this a bit more and find out why, we, why we've why we become such shallow thinkers. And uh, I think a large, large part of it does come down to multitasking. Is it in the UK now, people check their smartphones 21 times an hour and they switch channels 150 times a day. So the, our phones have become such a big part of our lives and they've given us loads of freedom and enabled us to do loads of different things. And we also, we, we think we're pretty good at multitasking as well. So we, it, earlier in the year, we did a neuroscience study. And uh, before, before we uh, gave people these tasks, we asked them how they felt about the multitasking. And everyone was like, yeah, yeah, I multitask loads. Oh, how do, how do you think you are in it? Yeah, really good, really, really, really helps me get lots done. And uh, we also, we got told this anecdote about a, um, an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley who at the end of a long day will go home and watch four films because he watches two at a time. And he says that because they have different narrative arcs, he can follow them simultaneously and take it all in. I mean, I, I would question that, and that is obviously an extreme, but th this why is it multitasking, I think most people can relate to in their own lives and like doing lots of different things simultaneously. But we've never actually stopped to question if it's helping us or hindering us. And the reality is, what we call multitasking is not actually multitasking. Because the, the term multitasking was created to, where in the birth of computers, when they first started uh, having a processor that could run multiple things at the same time. And as Dan said earlier, we're not like computers. We're built very differently. We've evolved a lot slower than computers have. And the reality of what we're doing is a completely different thing called task switching, which Rather than like doing lots of things simultaneously and be increasing our effectiveness, task switching is about switching between different tasks very quickly at a very shallow surface level. So we're, we're not getting into the same amount of depth, but just switching between things very quickly. And, uh, and it, it, it's a completely different process. And I think it's worth just up front as well, while we're here, busting a few myths on what, busting a few myths on what, uh, 
people's perceptions of multitasking might be. Because the, uh, oh, the clip is going crazy. Um, the, the, in reality, people, people often talk about how women are way better at multitasking. There's loads of studies that show that there are no differences in gender whatsoever. Men, women are just as bad as men are at multitasking. Um, people also think like, if you're smarter, you might be better at multitasking. There's a study at Stanford that showed that that's just completely not true. Uh, smarter people are no better at multitasking than anyone else. Uh, and the third one as well, which comes up a lot, is about digital natives and millennials and how, because they've grown up with technology, they must be a lot better at it. And the reality is they're not. We, we've seen a lot of neuroscience studies. Millennials think they're a lot better at it, but in reality, their brains work just as badly with multitasking as everyone else's. Uh, and it, when we're doing all these different things, it's not just ma making us wor worse in that moment. It's actually having a big effect on our cognition as well. So people might not realize, but every time you switch tasks, it costs you mental energy. We, are, we have a finite resource called cognitive load, which you can basically think of as your head space. It's, you, it's the biological equivalent to RAM in a computer, and it basically is the physical limitation of how we juggle information and how we can have lots of different things going on simultaneously. And obviously, as communicators, our job is about helping people understand things, and like get sort of messaging and uh, experiences. And if people are overloaded with information, if they have such little cognitive load to do, it makes our job a lot harder. So going on to the exciting bit now, which had, had all the tech up at the start, uh, I'm going to hand over to Thomas, who's in a sec, who's going to do the live experiment where we're going to peek inside someone's brain in real time. Then we're going to get them doing a, a real-world multitasking thing, where they're like, a, a, Thomas will talk through it in more detail, but a real task that you would do in your day-to-day. -day. And uh, so we've got Danielle over there in the, in the weird headset. Some of you might know him as the founder of Creative Social. And he's got an EEG headset on, which will be measuring his brain waves in real time. Uh, so Thomas, uh, he is the new founder of Neurons Inc. And he is, also has a PhD in neuroimaging. He's, he wouldn't, want, wouldn't admit it himself, but he's one of the world's leaders in neuromarketing. So I'll hand over to... Thanks. OK, great. I guess this is going to be a high risk, high gain, or high loss. I mean, we'll see how that works out. So, the whole idea here is that we are going to talk about the live experiment. What, you know, we're actually going to test cognitive workload. So basically juggling and increasing the juggle, uh, mental juggle, so to speak, and see exactly how what's going on in the person's brain at the same time. Now, I'm going to speak very briefly about what that means. So workload in general uh, means you know, the amount of information you're processing at any one time. Right? So if you're now focusing on a narrative on the screen, you're doing something on the, uh, on the PC at the same time, and you're receiving a text message. So that's three different things, right? Three different balls you have to keep in the air at the same time, because even though you're switching back and forth, you still have to have that information in mind, right? In order for you to remember where you were at in the narrative, on the PC, on the text messaging. So what we're going to do here today is to look at uh, brain activation while a person is looking at ads on one side, and then we're going to increase the workload uh, for that person and see what's going on. Basically, what we're going to look at is the brain, part of the brain that's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And now I know that's a fancy word we have. We, we're fond of fancy words. But basically, this is the part of the brain you can point on here. Uh, it's the part of the brain that is responsible and has an active part in cognitive workload. So what we have here is the dashboard on the left side, which is running uh, ABM BLI, uh, BLO Live. What we have done, because this dashboard is really um, kind of technically sophisticated, we have made a representation here, a 3D representation we're going to show you in a second as well, that shows you the actual load and how that works when we increase the workload for that person. So first of all, while uh, we have ad watching here, uh, we will see there are some brain activation. Just to introduce you to that 3D uh, brain rendering. So this is the brain. This is activation shown on the brain. So just to make that simple, each dot is a kind of a point of activation representing activation of the brain. So this is just a representation of that. So now, so there is working on watching television. Is watching, we've made a roll of uh, advertisements running. And there's all different kinds of ads. Funny ones, you know, uh, it could be for social courses and things like that. So we're going to focus on the part of the brain, as I mentioned, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And we kind of isolated activation of that part here. So this we're just going to uh, show how the activation is increased 
uh, in that particular region as we now give uh, a, a, a larger task load, so to speak. So, so now we're going to look at, just focus on the ad, focus on the, the narrative. It's very rare that we have that a luxury in consumers that they will pay attention to your ad, right? But still, the more we focus on the ad, uh, the more we focus on the narrative of the ad, the more we see a stronger activation in that part of the brain. The cognitive workload is actually higher. What we also have seen is that that can some, sometimes cannibalize uh, brand communication. So the more you actually like an ad, the less you tend to remember about what it was for, which kind of defies the purpose, doesn't it? Right? Okay, now the next step we're going to have is this time we're going to ask you to start searching so we've given you uh, some tasks to start doing. While you're watching the ad, you're going to search for some different travel destinations on the PC. What we expect to see is higher workload happening on the screen here. We're going to show that as a representation as well. Let's see here. Well, we can actually see the brain activation actually increasing. We, you know, technically speaking, we also see some ventral street activation going from the, the areas defining um, meaning, recognizing objects, faces, text, and so forth. We see that the workload is actually then going up and up. This is related to higher activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Okay, while the person is doing this, we'll add an, a third task. So we have Mike over here sending text messages, messages to his smartphone. So he's gonna do something else as well. I'm gonna see what happens then. So there are three tasks to do then. Keep attention to the ad keep attention to the PC task of finding a travel destination. And my guess is that we're going to switch uh, the travel destination sometimes to make some confusion as well. Right, so what's going on in his brain here? He has, to three, has three tasks to keep in mind at the same time, right? So the workload is going to go even higher, right? Here, what we're going to see here is that on the representation here is that the activation is going to go haywire. Let's see here. The representation is going right. So that sometimes we actually see a collapse of that activation and the person will just stare blankly on the screen. Just nothing goes in, nothing is remembered. Right, so that's basically an overload of the system at this time. Okay. So what we call this is basically a bottleneck effect. You know, the way we see it is that there's only so much information you can take into uh, account at any one time. This is why we see magic tricks are working. It's simply because that you pay attention to some things, the magician is fooling you by misdirecting your attention to some other things, right? We call this the bottleneck effect. So this was partly a, a live metric of the brain. i hand it over to you again. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Thomas. So as you can see there, as people multitask more, our job becomes a lot harder because they're juggling all this information and it just becomes more stressful. They have much less headspace to dedicate to what we're doing but yet we're still creating ads that require a lot of attention for, uh, in what we're doing. So what, what's the solution here? How do, how do we move forwards? Well, I think like, unless we start putting chips in people's brains, the, the brain just isn't evolving quick enough here for us to, for, to, to adapt to us. So instead, obviously, we need to adapt to the reality of how people are behaving now. And there are, there are some things we can do to communicate to people using other open channels into their brains, because the, the, there are certain parts that are overloaded, but there are clever techniques we can start to use to find other ways in. So I think for brands moving forward, it's going to need to be a much bigger focus on neural optimization. So creating things that are optimized for the reality of how people are behaving. And I, I talked a bit before about how cognitive load is the brain's equivalent to RAM. When your computer's overloaded, you overclock it and you get, try and get more out of the limitations of what you have. But then we, like, how do we do that for the brain? We need to think about how can we start overclocking the cortex and find other ways into the brain. Um, something you guys might have heard a, lot, heard a bit about is all the like, brain training games, which uh, the, so there's a $1 billion industry now of lots of companies doing this with, make, with games that make you smarter, make you more alert, make you able to learn faster. The reality is none of them work. <laughs> they all have lots of claims on their websites, lots of... Uh, backing but it, there's, there's been an independent research that piece done by lots of the world's leading neuroscientists and they've been discredited by the entire scientific community for now I mean right now we have no evidence to say that they work so the brain the brain just isn't going to adapt to the tech that we're giving it so instead how are we going to change our advertising to do this and how are we going to find other ways in because people are exposed to 3,000 adverts a day now 
and you've got all these different things fighting for your attention. So, the, 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 and a lot of it is very like visual eye grabbing stuff. So, when your visual channels are so overloaded, we can start to think about how we can use audio and other other like non visual channels to communicate to people. Uh, we can start to think about how we how can we use context and personalization to help people detect relevance in what we're doing and help help them know that it's for them. We can start to uh, find ways to bypass the conscious learning because obviously. All of this stuff is about, we've talked about it, it's conscious learning, but there's, there's also the non-conscious as well. So how can we start to reach people through that? So for the final section, I'm going to hand back, hand back to Dan, who's going to take us through some examples of how we can start to do this for, for us already. And uh, this is based on a big, big process that we're going through at Hey Human at the moment, where we're trying to create a set of neural optimization tools that can make sure that every ad that we're doing is not not in the 89% of adverts that get ignored, but in the 11% of that actually get processed uh, in, through people's brains. So, hand over to Dan for the examples. So I think just, just in the spirit of this, we'll try and keep this really simple at the end, so the three things to take out. Um, and really this is, you know, it's just, it's just thinking about how we can start to apply some of these considerations. There are lots more than three things, but it's really just to sort of um, give you some simple takeaways today. And I think importantly, before we go into it, this is not necessarily saying that these are completely new, new rules for creative. It's reframing the, the context of where we communicate. And that really is in reality of overloaded um, sort of people that receive the ads, but also you know, in the context of continuous partial attention. So I think first and foremost is um, looking at um, multi-sensory marketing. So, uh, what, we, what I want to show you here is um, what Phoenix was saying, right? where we have overclocked um, elements of, of people's working memory, you can actually use a separate channel. So audio is incredibly effective at uh, actually bringing people's attention back to the screen. And in this particular ad that we'll share with you, um, in our research, people's eyes actually came back up from their, from the, from their smartphones and their laptops because the audio is so arresting. And I think the important thing to emphasize here in um, an arena of ever crowded TV screens where you've been watching a TV program but there are interstitials coming in at the bottom, coming up next. And you know, personally I find that really infuriating. I think it's it's really thinking about less is more. So when you synchronize visuals brilliantly with audio as this app does, um, it really brings your attention back to it. And I think importantly what this also does, which is really cute, is it's based on a speed reading app called Spritz. So this is actually a, an app for Honda called Keep Up that you may have seen um, but I, I hope you haven't because it's, it's great to see. And it actually takes you up to a thousand words per minute, but it gamifies attention in such a way that you can barely take your eyes away from it. overclocking the computer, uh, it doesn't get much better than that. So just a really good example of how there's huge opportunity in neurosonics. And I think with the, the sort of advances um, in, in sort of digital media, this is only an area that's going to grow. So I think it's thinking about the mnemonics um, of you know, some of this could be getting back to jingles, for example. I think also, and this is uh, where I could potentially get pelted with rosé, but we'll give it a go. Um, the second uh, thing that there's an obvious implication of what we're looking at is although storytelling is deified in the so this is quite a difficult um, stage in which to say this, actually sometimes, and to Thomas's point earlier on, storytelling can get in the way of takeouts because people fall in love with the narrative so much and you'll often have this experience of like, oh it's a great ad for this thing, I can't remember who it's for, but like this is a guy on a jet ski and so on. And it's just kind of, I think it's you know, we've got a magician in the background here because this is exactly what magicians do. They weave incredibly powerful narratives because they don't want you to look at what this hand is doing. And in a way, that's almost, it can be quite self-defeating in that storytelling if it's too strong can actually overpower the brand and what it's forced. The takeout story, not actually the, the, the desire to take out from a commercial point of view. 
And I suppose in this, in this context, it's thinking about how we um, deliberately go into our comms planning with um, high engagement, lean forward communication, but then also low involvement um, branding. And so the work of Byron Sharp, I think, is only going to grow. Um, we're seeing this in, in lots and lots more work. And I think in the context of um, engagement times that are increasingly going to be measured in seconds, this is something you'll see a lot more of. And this, this is really around the use of um, key brand assets. So it's the colorways, iconography, logos, which might be used in a, in a flash kind of engagement, but it's amazing how powerful that kind of unconscious priming towards your brand is. And I think also, although, you know, and this, this is where I will get killed, although sometimes the logo could do to be a bit bigger, it's not about just, you know, making that boring and making it um, a horrible, laborious task. We can have fun with it as well. So I just think this next example was a really cute example from McDonald's, um, which was actually around the Winter Olympics. And this is the world's longest ski jump. And you know, they've taken the old marches here and just brilliantly and creatively put them in put them in the shop for awareness as obviously the taste of skis. And so it's just really thinking more and more about this, this kind of stuff. And I think as we move from mobiles to wearables, increasingly success is going to be measured not in the amount of the length of engagement, it must probably much higher frequency, but actually set the session times that are measured in split seconds. So I think this is you know an increasing opportunity area. And then I think just just moving on, um, it's it's really I think one of the richest opportunities we have in coming years is going to be around contextual relevance. And this this is actually neuroscience is known as the cocktail party effect, where if you're in a, a packed room like this. Um, if, someone, if someone says your name across the room, your head usually immediately snaps over there. Um, so, you know, this is kind of something we can, we can actually try and do a lot more in terms of looking at how we can deliver much more personal relevance to people, which could be a mixture of geolocation, it can be using richer data sets and actually um, mixing together APIs in high creative ways. So, there was a fantastic um, campaign for a, a brand called Kleenex in the UK, it's a tissue brand, and they actually looked at um, flu outbreaks on Twitter, and then geo-targeted SMS campaigns to the areas where they had high flu, flu reporting. So, you know, really interesting, and they got a four-fold response rate to that campaign, probably because it was found on relevant, and I think increasingly that's what we're all looking for. We're too busy and overloaded to have to decode messaging, just make it right for me, and make, you know, design the experience to be an ad for that moment, not just at that moment. And so here we just wanted to share a really, a really cute example um, of, and I, th I think it's just really seen in, this is a, a, um, a pre-roll video in Facebook, but the, um, the brand Hotels.com has brilliantly anticipated the fact that obviously they pre-roll with no audio, so they're specifically designed and created to be relevant in that context. And it's quite funny how people often will engage with this at a primary level and then go back and watch it with audio to make them laugh. So check this one out. So I think just, um, you know, that's just a great and super simple example of how you can start to think more about context. Equally relevant for YouTube free roles in terms of you haven't got a 30 second window of opportunity, you've got a five second window before they hit the skip button and move on to the content you want. It's really thinking about that. So I think just to, just to wrap this up a little bit, um, when we think about the digital revolution versus human evolution, there isn't really a versus anymore. It's, it, the battle is over and digital won. So I think it's, you know, in the context of the live experiment, um, which Danielle is still going at, I think, for that. Um, but what we've shown is you get this increasing load. So the appropriate conceptual framework for us to dig into is we're talking to people that are already overloaded. And in that, in that context, our job is not just to always be engaging or always lean forward, this is me, it's to actually make things easy for them. So make our creative campaigns brain-friendly. So I think this is, you know, it's 
these are new steps in neuroscience for all of us. I think you know the, the level of understanding is only going to grow. And yes, it's a tough subject, but it's a fascinating new frontier for creativity. So I think with these small steps and you know going into creative processes armed with techniques that can make our campaigns more effective, we can get huge leaps in, in creative insight and also effectiveness. So there you go. Thank you.